Welcome everybody to this evening's program. Um, our guest author is Michelle Jerishim. Uh, he's a local author. He formerly lived in Paoli and that's how we got to know him. He and his wife used to visit the Paoli Library all the time. And he has since moved to Philadelphia to be close to all the uh, restaurants and theaters and things like that, which I suppose these days he's not going too much, but hopefully we'll be able to once again soon. Uh, Michelle is the author of Out of the Shadows, a memoir, Survival in Nazi-Occupied France, and Making a Life in America. Um, we've arranged with a bookstore in Wayne, Main Point Books, which is on North Wayne Avenue, to uh, carry Michelle's book. So if you'd like to purchase a copy, please visit Main Point Books. Um, they're wonderful there, and um, I know I checked, and they do have copies available. Uh, well, welcome, Michelle, and we look forward to hearing your story. Um, so please tell us about yourself and your experiences and your book. Good evening, and thank you for joining. And I also want to thank the different public library and Marianne Hooper in particular for the opportunity to tell you a bit about my story. When I say a bit, I use that word advisedly because in an hour or so, I have to condense a story that took me 12 years to write. Why did it take so long? And why did I start in the first place? As to the first question, writing is a demanding enterprise, but a memoir has a particular challenge. In a word, it's memory. Memory is elusive and misleading and often self-serving. But I think it's incumbent to be as true to the past as possible, and this requires research. Digging up old letters, photographs, documents, interviewing relatives and contemporaries, searching public records. This is a very slow process, but that is actually beneficial because time gives you perspective and it, allow, it allows one to gradually come to terms with one's past to the extent that that's ever possible. As to what impelled me to write, it was not a decision made on a particular day. It was not even a decision in the usual sense. It was an imperative that evolved over time, a need which ultimately I could not deny. I elaborate on this in the prologue to my memoir, parts of which I will now paraphrase. In 2008, my wife, Joan, and I received the gift of our first grandchild. Motivated by her arrival, I embarked upon the pages that follow. But that was really the end point of the process to begin writing, which had started 20 years earlier. In the summer of 1989, Joan and I took a trip to France to try to find the French Catholic family that had sheltered me during World War II. Joan, a psychologist, was insistent that we take this trip. She understood the psychological necessity. The result of that trip was to open a crack in the wall of self-protection that I had built around myself for decades. I was five years old when I saw my parents for the last time and almost simultaneously separated from my older siblings, dislocated from everything that was familiar to me and thrust into the hands of strangers. Those strangers were the Leclerc family, the French Catholic family whom I just alluded to, and who later had wanted to adopt me. Other events transpired which further opened the crack. I now have lived much longer than those early tumultuous years, but their effect has never escaped me. Those years loom large in my rational and irrational thoughts, my interpretation of events, and my view of the world. Yet they have not subdued me. After immigrating to the USA, I adapted because I had to adapt. I slowly became an American. I became a Brooklyn Dodgers fan. I went to public school, high school, college, graduate school, and built a career. I married and had children and grandchildren. I lead a good life, but it's colored by a past that's been my constant companion. How often have we heard people say how much they regret not having interviewed their parents or grandparents 
while they were alive about their family's histories. Here, I'm anticipating that interview one day, but the underlying incentive has been for me to try to emerge from the shadow of World War II and reconstruct a lost childhood, which I've had a yearning to touch ever since. A running theme in my memoir is the unpredictability of life. Of course, unpredictability, unpredictability, like the tossing of a coin, has two faces. An unexpected event can come true, and on the other side of the coin, an event that was seemingly certain to happen does not. As sure as I'm speaking to you right now, I would have been dead 78 years ago, if not for a completely chance event. What happened then? I will tell you shortly, but to make this episode understandable, I need to take you back to 1937, the year I made my entry into this world. I was born in Paris, and here's a map of Paris, and, and the 14th arrondissement, which is right around here. And for the first year or so of my life, I lived in the neighborhood called Vincennes, just to the east of the Paris city line. And here's Vincennes, is right around here. There I lived with my parents, my sister Alice, nine years older, and my brother Simon, seven years older. Then we moved just a bit north to the neighborhood called Montreuil, which is right around here, uh, right here, Montreuil. The seemingly small detail that we initially lived in a particular neighborhood is actually crucial to our survival. My parents had lived there for several years prior to my arrival, and my mother, who was a very gregarious person, developed many warm relationships with shopkeepers and merchants in the neighborhood. How that helped us survive, I will also tell you in a moment. My parents had immigrated from Poland in the early 1920s. They were married in Paris in 1927, 10 years before I was born. This photo shows my mother on the left, my father on the right, and between my, uh, my mother's youngest brother and one of her sisters. My father had trained in Poland to be a watchmaker. At the time, a very skilled occupation. Here's a photo of a watchmaking workshop in Warsaw before my parents lived there. And here on the second from the left is my father and two positions to his left is a, a colleague who happened to be my mother's youngest brother whom I showed you in the previous picture. And I presume that this is how uh, my mother and my father met. My father brought his skills to France and established a workshop in our apartment. At that time, there was still a shortage of manpower in France a result of the massive loss of life in World War I. So my father and my uncle as well were imported skilled labor, as it were, but my parents never did become citizens. To some extent, that's analogous to our own environment here today. We lived a relatively comfortable life in Montreuil. My father worked. As I mentioned, he had a studio in our apartment. My mother did the necessary, or the, excuse me, the customary housewifely duties. Though her cooking was in French, one of her very few shortcomings. My siblings went to a nearby public school and I went to a nursery school. That was our life until May 1940. When Germany invaded France, an event that changed our lives forever. France had an army of, of over 3 million men and yet was defeated in a staggeringly short time, six weeks. If this is all I had to say about those six weeks, it would give you no sense of the chaos and the human toll imposed upon the civilian uh, population. And here, I would like to give you a sense of that chaos. Um, by reading an excerpt published at the time, and here is the quote, and you can read along with me if you like. 
As the German invasion progressed unchecked, the Parisians began their exodus from the city ahead of the invading army. The foreign correspondent, Walter Kerr, described the atmosphere of the city in the last edition of the newspaper, the International Herald Tribune, distributed in Paris on June 11, 1940. Paris, before dawn yesterday, was a city of men, women, and children fleeing to safety of countless thousands of families, joining the millions of refugees from the north who have fled before the German mechanized army in these last few weeks. All day long, streams of cars and trucks loaded down until the springs gave way, poured out of the city. It was heartbreaking to watch them, for there, once more, was a sad old story that has been told so many times of twisted lives, of poverty, of flight before an invader, of separation, perhaps forever, from mothers and fathers and children. They lined up at railroad stations carrying overwhelming bundles. They piled into all cars that hammered and pounded their way along the roads. I do not know exactly when they began to realize their city and perhaps their lives were in danger. Dot, 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 that's the, the end of, the, of what I'm quoting. And this is an illustration of what's happening on the roads. Two million people fled Paris proper and its surroundings. By the time the Germans entered Paris, two thirds of the inhabitants of Paris had fled. The Parisians were joined by refugees from Belgium and Northern France. And now the stream of refugees had swelled to eight million. Eight million. It's almost unimaginable, it's like emptying New York City. My family and I were in that stream of refugees, but we split up. My father and my older siblings went in one group and my mother and I in another to avoid being all of us being killed at the same time, if that were to happen. But the ordeal was made worse by the fact that German planes strafed the column of refugees. My brother told me that he and my father dived into a ditch to avoid being killed. But 100,000 people did die on this journey. Probably many more would have if the war had lasted more than six weeks. Soon after the armistice, which was signed on June 22, 1940, Germany established control over France and almost immediately began a campaign of repression and murder. Already in the fall of 1940, Jews were ordered to go to their local police station to get identification cards. My parents dutifully reported the word Juif was stamped across the ID card in red letters. And not long after, June 7, 1942, the German military commander in France ordered all Jews over six years of age to wear a yellow star on their chests. And this is what it looked like. I did, not have to, I did not have to wear one because I was not yet six. However, long before this decree, life for Jews was already becoming fragile. Starting in 1941, the Nazis began to organize raids or roundups on the Jewish population of Paris. Three such roundups occurred between May and December 1941. But it's important to note that while the Nazis ordered these raids, it was the French police who carried them out. Early in 1942, the so-called final solution became official Nazi policy. In Paris and its surrounding communities where the majority of Jews lived, the Nazis and the collaborationist French police set this policy in full motion. The largest of the roundups was scheduled for the early morning of July 16, 1942. Beginning at 4 a.m. on 16 July 1942, about 4,500 French policemen carried handfuls of a total of over 27,000 27, index cards with the addresses and names of Jews to be arrested. <clears throat> In the end, about 13,000 Jews were arrested you may have noticed that this is looked only about half of the intended arrests. When I say only, this is not a fact to rejoice. <clears throat> there is a tendency 
we're speaking about murder of an incomprehensible scale, to shut down our minds. <clears throat> if we hear about the murder of a single individual, we are horrified because we can identify with a single person. It could have been any one of us. But thousands or more, we can't put ourselves mentally in that place. So we resort to statistics. Evidently, we were not among those arrested that night. Here's what happened. By chance, my mother had a dental appointment on the 15th of July, one day before this roundup. It happens that the dentist that she was going to had a French policeman for a patient who had told that dentist about the impending roundup. And the dentist told my mother, place yourself in that situation. What would you have done? Would you have dis dismissed this news as an old wife's tale? Think about the consequences of believing or not believing this warning. Well, my mother took it to heart and we spent that night in the home of our cleaning lady. That raid did take place. And here I want to read a quote from a book about what happened to the children who had been arrested that night. Every time I read this, it makes me want to cry. And here's the quote, and feel free to read it along with me. This is the dedication of a book written by Susan Zakati, with the title as you see up on the bottom of the screen. This book is dedicated to the more than 3,500 Jewish children under the age of 14 who were arrested in Paris on July 16, 1942, and forcibly separated from their mothers at the French camps of Pithiviers and bon la hollande two weeks later. Their mothers were deported. The children had to fend for themselves until they too were deported, bewildered, terrified, and alone, in sealed cattle cars without light or air, to be murdered upon arrival at Auschwitz. This is what would have happened. Excuse me, go back. This is what would have happened to me and my siblings. After the raid, we were essentially homeless. If you remember, I mentioned earlier that my mother had many friends among the merchants in her old neighborhood of Vincennes. There are too many details to mention here, but through one of her acquaintances, we were eventually introduced a Protestant family, here pictured, Monsieur and Madame Bonneau, with their granddaughter at, uh, when that picture was taken. The Bonneaus were Protestant, and you may know that Protestants themselves had been a persecuted minority in France, which had generated a kindred association with Jews. They were, in fact, rescue networks operated by Jewish, Catholic, and Protestant organizations. Their main objective was to save the children. Again, there are too many details to introduce right now. But through the Bonneaus, my siblings and I were connected to different households in Normandy. I was placed with a French Catholic family, Marcel and Suzanne Leclerc and their son Gaston, in a small town called saint aubales elbeuf at Normandy. They were among thousands of French families who faced severe penalties for harboring a Jew. It seems Monsieur Leclerc had an extra reason to thwart the Nazis. I learned after the war that he was a member of the Resistance, the French underground. I was lucky because the Leclerc stuck to me. This photo was taken relatively shortly after I arrived. That's Madame Leclerc, Suzanne, behind me. And maybe a year or so later, another picture with this nazi suit that undoubtedly Madame Leclerc had sewed herself. And then later on, a typical picture, one of those stock poses for a family picture. And if you did not know otherwise, the body language speaks of an integrated family. By that time, the Leclerc's clearly thought it would be that way. In Saint Aubin, I went to school. I played soccer in the schoolyard. I went to church and Sunday catechism. 
Of course, this was to make me blend in. But as best I can remember, the Leclerc's never tried to indoctrinate me. And I give them credit for this because it was not the case for many, for many young hidden uh, Jewish children, hidden Jewish children, for whom this led to further trauma and identity crisis after the war. Anyway, from my perspective as a child, life at the Leclerc's seemed normal in the sense that there was a stable routine. But then June 6, 1944 came, and with it, the Allied invasion and landings on the Normandy beaches. This is a map of Northwest France. It shows you what was happening where, and here are the D-Day landing beaches. And the map is a bit misleading. It doesn't really show that the, the, the breadth of the landing beaches are miles and miles apart. But here you see Santo Banazadva, where I was, not too far from the landing beaches. And below that, Savigny le Vieux, which was the village where my brother and my sister were both hidden, but in different households. So we were witness to uh, convoys of Germans receding and allies going forward. No single picture can, ca can, can capture the monumental scale of D-Day. But my brother's contemporaneous watercolor is as about as suggestive as anything can be. The legend on the bottom says, Souvenir du 6 juin 1944, which is a remembrance of 6 June 1944. He was 14 and a half when he did this without formal training. It probably wouldn't surprise you to know that he became a prominent commercial artist. Finally, the Allies made a breakthrough on the 28th of August and on the, on the 20th of August, 1944. My town was liberated by the 2nd Canadian Army Corps. When the Allies entered the town or village, they were mobbed <clears throat> by delirious people, and young boys like me would swarm to their vehicles. And here's a photo of what happened, typical of what happened. This picture was in a neighboring town of mine, so I'm not on that tank, but I had the exact same experience in, in my town. I lived with the Leclerc's until the summer of 1945. At that time, we had not received any news from our parents. When my siblings and I had been secreted to Normandy, my parents had been advised to go to the unoccupied zone of France. But this we learned only much later. <clears throat> and this is a map to show the partition of France under the Nazis. For some time, the southern, uh, the unoccupied zone, which is in blue, was relatively safer, not totally safe, but relatively safer. My parents attempted to cross that border Unfortunately, they were arrested trying to cross that border at the town of Poitiers, right there. But we did not discover this until the year 2000, 58 years after it happened, after their arrest, due to the bungling of the arresting officers who misspelled my parents' names. A Frenchman by the name of Serge Klarsfeld made it his life's mission to document the fate of every Jewish person deported from France. It's a monumental work, first published in 1978, but my parents' names didn't seem to be there. My brother contacted Mr. Klausfeld to see if he could help, and indeed he did. Combining other data by my parents, besides the arrest record, he found them on the list of persons sent to Auschwitz on, by train on September 11, 1942. There were 1,000 persons on that convoy. All thousands were murdered upon arrival. In 2012, Monsieur Klarsfeld published a revised edition of his tome to include people who had been missing from that tome. And there, my parents were correctly listed. And here is page 322 of that volume, an immense volume. And you can see page 322, and we're only at the, J, at the J's. And I've highlighted in red, excuse me, in yellow, my parents' names. And here they are. 
in black and white, at least they will not disappear from history. Based on this gigantic record, a memorial was installed in Paris with the names inscribed on it of every person born from France. And here's a, a long view of part of the courtyard uh, where those, the wall of, of names, the uh, Mur des Noms in French, and there's more than just what's pictured here. There are 76,000 or so names inscribed on those, on those walls. And here's a close up of where my parents' names are located. My mother here, Sonia, my father here, Wolf. Let's now backtrack for a moment to 1945. The Leclerc's wanted to adopt me. But my uncle David found me and reclaimed me on behalf of my family. And there was really nothing the Leclerc's could do about it. However, my uncle was not in a position to care for the three of us, and so we were placed in a maison d'enfant, a softer version of an orphanage, because all the uh, tenants, so to speak, there, all the children there were survivors, and the, the, the adults who ran the maison d'enfant were themselves older survivors. So we were placed in an orphanage be before we actually knew we were orphans. Now let me fast forward a bit. <clears throat> we had another uncle and a grandmother in New York City <clears throat> who had come there well before the war. And after a lot of bureaucratic paperwork, my siblings and I were able to immigrate to the USA. And we were to live with our uncle. Here we are, the day before leaving, saying au revoir to France. This is October 1949. You know, in the immediate post-war years, America was pictured as a Shangri-La, heaven on earth. The streets were paved with gold, all the women were beautiful and all the men handsome. It was a false picture, of course, but I think this was a widespread perception after the defeat of the seemingly invincible German army. So, this is the palace that we moved into in Brooklyn. Unfortunately, all the gold seemed to have already been picked up. We moved into my uncle's apartment. <clears throat> in that household on the third floor of that building, there were already seven individuals. And with the three of us, it made 10, all in a two bedroom apartment. However, this tight arrangement did not face me much. Living in an orphanage for the prior four years had, had cured me of the notion of privacy. Much later, the situation reminded me of a Woody Allen movie. So this was the beginning of my immigrant experience. Shortly after we arrived, I was enrolled in public school 179 in Brooklyn. In those days, there were no special programs to integrate immigrants, no tutoring of English, you were just thrown into the proverbial melting pot and you just did your best to keep your nose above water. So I just sat in class and looked around. I knew two words of English when I arrived. That was from the, the soldiers. <clears throat> Chewing gum. Although at the time I thought it was one word. But by and by, I started to absorb English mostly by osmosis. About two months later, after I was in, uh, enrolled in a school, around Christmas 1949, I could make out some basic sentences. And in class, I got the sense that the teacher was asking the kids to tell how they would be spending their Christmas vacation. Many of them seemed to be saying they were going to Miami. I perked up. They're trying to tell me they're going to see a friend. I made a mental note to tell them that the proper wording was mon ami. I was determined to adapt. It was not a conscious decision. It was something I felt in my bones to be necessary. I did not want to feel like a foreigner. I wanted to be accepted. I learned English rapidly, quickly enough to pass an entrance exam into a, a so-called elite high school in Brooklyn. I intuitively understood that education was my way out of poverty and into the mainstream. So then after high school, I went to CCNY, City College of New York, earned a bachelor's degree in electrical engineering, 
went to work for an aerospace company, which sent me to graduate school for a master's degree. But I still felt vulnerable. I had no extended family structure to back me up financially. So I decided that the best way to insulate myself from life's unpredictability was to get still more education. So I took a leave of absence from work to go back to graduate school. And in 1967, I earned my PhD from Penn. Life as a bachelor was great, but you all know how it is when you meet the right person, matrimony is not far behind. And so I got married to Joan. And here's our wedding picture, 51 years ago. We had two boys and life was on a steady keel but I couldn't let go of my early years psychologically. And so my wife, whom I mentioned earlier as a psychologist, understood the need to, to go back to France and try to recreate as best as possible some tangible elements of that early life. Unfortunately, when we arrived, the original adults in the house had passed away. But we did find there's some Gaston. And here's a picture of that day when we arrived and I think I've never had a bigger smile in any picture. On the right is Gaston with the quintessential French companion, a French poodle, his wife Micheline on the left, and their two grandchildren who happened to be there when we arrived unannounced, I must say. That's how conflicted I was. Reuniting with Gaston was the first opening into the repressed trauma I had experienced as a five-year-old. Other events took place that further helped to exercise that trauma. One of the most important of which was a pilgrimage to Auschwitz in 2001, which Joan again was instrumental in convincing me to do. To do. I had always been a firm Francophile uh, until I learned of the complicity of the French police in the deportation of my parents. Then I was mad as hell to France, but I shouldn't have been mad to the whole country because eventually I had to cool down. After all, my siblings and I and thousands of other Jewish children lived because of righteous French people. A long time ago, I had stumbled on a saying attributed to the Talmud. In case you don't know what that is, it's a compendium of interpretations and commentary on the Old Testament. That saying loosely translated is, he who saves one life saves the world. For a time, I pondered its meaning. And my interpretation is that one life leads to other lives and so on. And in a way, is that not the legacy most of us want to leave? Because I lived, these lives were born. Of course, I had a lot of help with that. But these particular individuals would not have been present had I not been saved. So these are my sons, Kenny and Claude, and their offspring, all six of them, and a seventh one, which occurred just uh, a few weeks ago, who declined to be interviewed for this <laughs> presentation. And that is the end of my prepared remarks, and I'll be happy to turn it over to the audience for questions. Michelle, thank you very much. Um, we'll open it now for uh, questions. Um, if you raise your hand, I'll unmute you and you can, we can uh, take questions. Okay, Heather? Uh, is there a way he can get back on the screen? Or no? I'm sorry? No? Come back on the screen? Or no? Oh, Minimize okay. your problem zone. Want me to come back on the screen? If yep. you can't, don't, don't, don't. I don't want to. <laughs> uh, I, I want to screw around here. No. I don't want to mess it up. <laughs> to use a French word, yes. So, okay. So I have a um, two prong question. Okay. First, I have a lot of questions, but I'll just ask this one for now. The All first right. one is um, Were you, when you were in Paris, in France, were you, uh, was, the fa was your family, your Jewish family, were they religious? That's my first, that's the first question. That's the first part of the question. Hey, I'm sorry, they, they, were they what? Religious. Religious, the answer is no. So they were like 
secular, yeah. Did they subscribe to any form of, like, were they secular human? Did they subscribe to any form of, do you know what I mean? Like, um, any other secular humanism or any other kind of thing, or they just were just non-religious Jews? I would say what you mentioned, secular humanism. Yeah, that would be, that was my guess. Okay, my next question is, so when you came to America and henceforth, did you, um, did you feel like you, the need to reject religion or the need to subscribe to it more? Um, because of what you went through. Well, I, I did not feel the need to subscribe to religion. Okay. Uh, uh, and I wouldn't use the word reject. Uh, I, I would say, um, I mean, reject in the sense that um, I, I'm against it, or if that's what you mean. No, I guess what I mean is this. So a lot of the survivors that I've talked to have, they've gone either way, it seems. They've either become completely religious or they've become not religious and they've all they like, rejected God basically for what happened. That that the latter is 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 about correct. Yeah. Yeah, but, yes. but later on oh. you broke the glass when you got married. Although <laughs> although well I guess you could say I identify culturally. Uh-huh. Okay. Uh religion per se and you know uh and, and uh, thanking God and appeals to God don't appeal to me. Mm -hmm. So, but I think that um, because the world has so many possible influences that mm -hmm. we felt necessary to not let um, influences that we don't like influence them. So we did send them to Hebrew school and had them bar mitzvah. And again, we I, we looked at it as as as, as a cultural, right? Um, you know, activity, not a religious one. And I know some people would, would contend that, but that's the way I felt. Were your friends in France like the people that your parents were friends with or close to? They were also not religious. Correct. Like, did the religious people live in a different area? Because I know the Fourteenth Iron Dismon isn't that. Is that Murray or is that not Murray? Uh, I'm sorry, could, can you repeat that? Yes. The, is Murray, because I know most of the Jews oh, live in Oh, oh, oh. I'm sorry. It, it was the pronunciation. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, God, I took five years of French and I still can't pronounce it right. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's Le Marais. Okay. Uh, uh, no, we did not live in the... Uh, that, that area was probably where the Orthodox people lived. Okay. And I, uh, early in the presentation, I pointed to where we live, which was just outside of Paris. Okay. Th that was a mixed neighborhood. Okay. Okay. Um, I'd like to move on to the next person. Um, Bernard, did you have a question? Can you un unmute yourself? Yeah, uh, Michelle, as, as you know, we go back a long ways together and your book, oh. brought memory, mem many memories. Yes. Of days in Brooklyn Tech and then even in the subway system. <laughs> uh, but I, ha I, you didn't speak at all, of course, which, which in all your modesty, you didn't speak at all about your tremendous co contribution to society in the, in the communication field that we all enjoy so much, except here on, on Zoom. <laughs> the, uh, the question I had was that, um, unfortunately, we have a situation where we have over 500 kids that have been separated by their parents, and they've been living in 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 a constant, literally in a concentration camp. And my question to you is, if you had a chance, what would you say to these children who have been separated, and what what is your advice to them? Gosh. Uh... Uh, that uh, it, it, that's a question that um, require a lot of thought. I mean, an answer. Uh, what would I say to them? 
What advice would you give to them? To, to a, an individual child? Well, you, you see or, a number of them that are, that are yeah. really desperate. I mean, they're, I, they don't speak the language just like you didn't. And, and you, you made a tremendous contribution in this country and your family. What would you say to these children that have nothing but despair to look forward to? Uh, I mean, so, you know, a lot of it has to do with what, what they're made of. You know, if they're able to overcome, you know, that the adversity of that sort, you know, I would, I would tell them to, to do that, to, to block out the bad parts, what they're experiencing focus on what they want to become and learn as much as they can, try to get as much education as they can, because I think that's the way out of their situation. Now, whether they could be able to do that in the situation that they're in, is another, that's another question. How, how would they be able to do that? How will, they, how will they be able to do that? At some point, they'll have to be released, right? Yeah. But where would that be? But that's what it, they'd have. They'd have to be single-minded and focused. Okay. Thank that. you. Thanks, Michelle. Sure, buddy. Um, Vanya and Todd, uh, question. Yes. Hi, Michelle. This is Vanya and Todd here. Um, I have a question about your older siblings. Did they do something similar to what you did in going back, kind of going through the, through their life story of where they were? Uh, well, I mean, we all three came to the U.S. Yeah, but I mean, when you went, you know, how you went back with your wife? Oh, whoa, whoa. no, 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 they did not. No, because we were all in different places, but some years before that, or, or I don't know exactly when, my sister did go back to visit the, the you know, the people that she had been with during the war. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, they had a different war experience. How was their, how was their experience different? Well, they were in the tiny hamlet. And mm -hmm. I, I don't know if I mentioned that um, they're quite a bit older than me. Um, Relatively speaking, um, my sister is nine years older. She may be watching this. I'm not sure. Uh, my brother is seven years older. So they, you know, they had a chance to know my parents, which I didn't really. So their entry, you know, their their experience after the invasion. Um, was, was psychologically different from mine. Mm -hmm. yeah. So yeah. I, I hope that answers your question. Uh, my, my, you know, they're, they're both here in the US. We all came together. Mm -hmm. They both have children, grandchildren. My brother has great grandchildren. Um, uh, not sure if I am answering the way you want uh, the answer. Yeah, no, I was just curious, you know, to see because because you took that undertaking, and I was curious to see whether they did as well. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Shani, you had a question. Um, Sorry, No. Right there. Um, Marianne, um, thank you and. Thank you so much, Michelle. So my, uh, my daughter here that's been waiting to hear from you forever, wanted you, uh, wanted just to find out, did you ever, because we don't know if you might've missed that detail, did you ever get to reunite with your parents? No. Never, no. They, um, I showed, I talked about it earlier that we, we had separated because my siblings and I had been, you know, uh, sent to, um, to Normandy, we did not know what had happened to our parents until that almost like half a century later. And they had been arrested trying to escape to the unoccupied zone oh. and put on a convoy to Auschwitz and murdered upon arrival in 1942. So after that initial separation, uh, we never saw them again. 
Do you have any other questions? Thank you very, very much. Thank you. Thanks for coming to me. Beverly, with a question? Hi. Yes, I did. Um, thank, you. Um, thank you, Mary Ann. Uh, I was wondering, you have these beautiful old photographs um, of your parents, um, of the Leclerc's, and I was just wondering how, in all the chaos of your moving around, you were able to preserve those, or were some of them preserved by your siblings? Um, how, how did you sort of piece together the, the family mementos? Um, well, the, er the early pictures of my parents uh, were in the possession also of my uncle, my mother's younger brother, whom I pointed out earlier. Do you, do you know what I'm referring to? Like in the watchmaking studio. Um, he was living in Paris as well, and he survived. So he had those photos. And after the war, uh, he gave them or made copies of them, I think, to my sister. Um, and the earlier pictures of me uh, with the Leclerc's um, were, were given to me or, or lent to me, which I made copies of when we reconnect or after we reconnected in 1989. Thank you very much. And also hello from Paoli Library. I've known you for many years even if you don't know who I am. <laughs> Paoli uh, Library? Yeah. Beverly's really the director at Paoli. Oh okay. Yeah. If, if uh yeah, when unfortunately you I can't see the yeah. No, I, I think I mostly see John coming in. <laughs> uh, I'm here. <laughs> yes, I guess. <laughs> I, I remember you because uh, you read the same sort of books I do a lot of the time. <laughs> uh, are there other Again. questions? Heather, you have another question? You unmute. Okay, can you hear me? Yep. Okay. So I do have another question. Um, I have a lot of questions. Um, I'm sure not that can all be answered tonight. Um, so I, I come from a background where my father w fought in the war and bombed Germany and then he actually fought in Israel. Um, and they were very active in the Holocaust stuff too, even though they weren't, he wasn't a survivor. He was, you know, he fought in World War II and then fought in Israel in 48 in the Machal. But anyway, so I, um, I've always been very connected to the Holocaust for whatever reason. And I, I have a very, a lot of anger toward the Germans and the Poles and the people that, you know, went along with this. I'm wondering how you, what do you, how do you feel about, you know, the Germans, I guess, as a whole? or the Polish as a whole, you know, um, and how have you been able to reconcile, you know, what they've done? Well, at the risk of sounding like a pitch, I talk about this in my post. <laughs> um, okay, I'll, I'll read it. it, I'll but, read it. But um, let's say what you just uh, expressed about your own feelings were, mine as well uh you know earlier like you know after the war and uh -huh. for, a number, for a number of years afterwards you know, over time my position has become much more nuanced right because you can't put a whole population you know in the same pot um you know there were rescuers in germany there were rescuers many actually the largest number of child oh. rescuers were in Poland. Really? Yes, yes, which may surprise, which does surprise a lot of people. Yes. Um, yeah, to some extent, it is surprising, but uh, <laughs> since I'm a technical guy, <laughs> I, uh, I have to point out that there were many more Jews to, to be saved right. in Poland. But nevertheless, um, the, the, the numerically there were more children saved by Polish Catholics than in any other country. 
And so, you know, there were, of course, uh, probably many more uh, anti-Semites in Poland than those righteous ones. But, you know, what it says is you, you can't paint you right. know, everyone with the same brush. And uh, it's the same thing with, with, with Germany. You know, I wouldn't touch a German-made anything right. for, for years and years. Neither would my dad. Yeah. And, you know, like he, yeah. And I probably still wouldn't buy a German car. But again, you know, we've met some... <laughs> some Germans who, I don't want to say good Germans, <laughs> but um, so, and I, I have to point out that, that Germany has been uh, more than any other country in Europe that murdered Jews, um, attempted to, um, what shall I say? Uh, I know, try to Mitigate the broad, yeah. Yeah. Can I say something? Yeah. Um, hi, I'm Michelle's wife. Uh, How are you? Uh, he married me, and my father was a German Jew who left in the early 30s saying Hitler is a menace, and I'm not, even though he had an advanced degree and a very good job, he left for Palestine. Uh, but uh, I went back to Germany about 10 years ago with a group without Michelle and two with some survivors and some Americans. And they have a curriculum in their schools and we visited one of the schools and they showed us all the books uh, that they have and they're true. Uh, one of them is for younger children uh, called When Hitler Stole the Pink Rabbit, which is talking mm -hmm. about a family that uh, walked across the border and were, um, and were safe. But they do have a curriculum, and I just want to tell you that. I want to ask one more loaded question. This is a very complex question, I guess, to answer. It's an easy question to ask. Um, so, Michelle, first of all, I want to thank both of you. And that's my first, I didn't thank you earlier. I want to really thank you for this. Um, but, but, um, I have always had a problem when I taught a Holocaust and a lot of stuff that I've done, I've always had a problem saying, why, did, why didn't people see this coming? Why didn't people do something? The Jews, I'm not talking about the non-Jews, the Jews. You know, why, you know, we have a history of, we have a history of this. This was just more mechanized and, you know, in that regard, but we have a history of this, the Spanish Inquisition, we can go back, the, you know, destruction of the temples. So my, I always wondered, like, why, you know, were people naive? In, in your, from your perspective, why do you think Jews didn't rise up? Jews didn't arm, Jews didn't, I mean, some did, obviously, but why as a whole, you know what I mean? Do you understand what I'm asking? I know it's a very loaded question. Well, but it bothers me. Um, you have a month? <laughs> I know, that's why I told you it's hard to answer, but it's right. I mean, there's, there's multiple reasons and, and, and depends on which country you were in. Right. And, but by and large, you know, people in that era, uh, first of all, you know, the, the, the Germans hid very well what they were doing until closer to the end. Mm -hmm. So the fact that you know, murder was going on at an industrial scale was not really known. You know, they made it seem as if it was you know, uh, work camps and the like. Um, and I mean, and it sounds easy to say rise up. You know, like imagine, you know, you're a family. Uh, you know, you, you've got the, the father who's working and typical in those days, the mother at home, the children at school. What, what would they do? You know, you'd have to have, and how do you get, you know, munitions? I mean, I know. What, is, what is rising up against a force that would have been overwhelming? So, uh, the, what did rise up only is, you know, is, was in Poland because there were right. a significant number, you know, the Warsaw Ghetto uh -huh. and a few others in Poland. But in other countries, there was really no physical possibility for it. Mm -hmm. 
And I guess people didn't see it, com like they didn't, like I see things coming now. And so I'm confused, so does my son, who's 20, you know, 20, he's gonna be 27. Um, I, did people not see it coming? I mean, you were young, I guess, but did people really not see this coming? You know, I, I don't. Well, I, I just said, yes, that, that when, when you say this, what is the this? The, the, the collection of, so to speak, the collection of Jews to eliminate them? Yeah. Uh, no, I think a lot of people didn't see it coming until it okay. came. Yeah. I think it would be so hard to imagine something like that. I mean, see, I, that, I guess that's where I feel a little bit like we have a history of it. So I'm confused why people didn't say, oh, now it's happening again or it could happen again or we better take action early or you know what I mean? Like, I guess it does depend on the country because like, you know, different things happen in different European countries, but. but hindsight. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I guess people didn't, I guess you're right, like people, right, people didn't, I guess they really, so they didn't see it, like your parents didn't really see this coming, to the degree that it obviously was. No, uh, no, no, I mean, they knew it wasn't good, all right? Yeah. Uh, they, they, I mean, they, I mentioned earlier, there were roundups in Paris earlier than the, the big one. Uh-huh. And, and, and uh, it wasn't being done, you know, secretly. They were just, you know, rounding up people on the streets or knocking on doors. It was well known. Right? The the, uh, the French police or the, the Germans didn't hide it. So my parents were aware of, of what was going on. But, you know, when you are settled in a situation, you, you, you tend to think it's not going to happen to me. Right. And that probably was the case for many, many people. And, but my mother at least had the foresight to believe uh, something that others did not. Right. And, uh, you know, better, <laughs> to use a, a too common phrase, better safe than sorry. And so, but even that, even that uh, the bit of foresight didn't help them in the end. So. Yeah. Well, it saved the saved your ch saved the children. Yes. Saved you guys. Thanks, Heather. Uh, Boyd, do you have a comment? Before the next question, I just want to apologize for everybody for the uh, for the early uh, delay. Yeah. Right. Joy, did you have a question or comments? Joy was on with her hands raised, but she's not responding. Hello. Can you unmute her? Hmm? Is What's she that? muted? Uh, Is she muted? She's not muted from my side. Okay. Um, I'm trying to start the video now so that you can actually see me, but it says I can't. Okay. Do, we'll we'll move on to Dottie. We have a question from Dottie. Okay. Go ahead, Dottie. You need to. Uh, un Unmute yourself. Hi. Thank you, uh, Michelle and Joan. Um, I see that you're recording this. Is this going to be available for people to watch at any time? Yes. Um, the Tradifferent Public Library will do a little bit of editing and um, it'll be available <laughs> probably in the next week, if not two weeks at the most. Thank you. It was very good. Yeah, we have a, there's a YouTube channel for the library, so you'll be able to access it there. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Marianne, I, I just want to say something. Um, prompted by what this lady just uh, mentioned. If, I, I don't know what the beginning is going to look like because obviously it was uh, messed up, but I'd be willing to sit down with you again, you know, via Zoom and just uh, re you know, record the initial few minutes or whatever it is. I, I think we can cut pieces out that don't work. And if you'd like, I can run it by you before we publish it. Okay. 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 Any other questions? Ronnie and Todd, did you have another question? 
Yeah, um, Mike, uh, I understand the complications earlier because it went a lot like our meetings at work ha do have to. <laughs> Thank you for even being gracious. Even before there was Zoom, right? But um, I had a question. Uh, I grew up in Arlington, Virginia, and I happened to be there when the National Holocaust Museum there opened, and that's always been probably the most memorable memorable museum I've ever been to. I was wondering if you have if you've done anything with with them at all. Uh, the Holocaust Museum? Yes. yes. Well, we donated. Um, <clears throat> let's see. Um, <laughs> we we would have and probably will, you know, once COVID is uh, defeated. Um, so we interact, my um, publisher and I have uh, communicated with them. And they want us to give a talk there, but obviously right now it can't happen. Um, let's see, what else? I, I did see that your suitcase was in there. <laughs> yeah, the, su the suitcase. Uh, some of you have may have seen the movie several years ago, Paddington Bear with a little suitcase. Yep. A teeny suitcase. Michelle had a, a little teeny suitcase like that. And he also had some letters from your parents? No, no, letters between my, my siblings and me. Letters between his siblings and him, which the Leclerc's kept and saved for 40 years or whatever. And he uh, uh, got it in 1989 when we went back and donated it to the Holocaust Museum. So those letters are in that suitcase. Oh, that's um, awesome. That's, you know, that's the extent of my interaction. But I, my, you know, the, um, the watercolor that I showed you earlier done by my brother, uh, he's done, he had done then uh, another, maybe another 10 or 12 of them. And uh, he, those were donated to the Holocaust Museum as well. Interesting. Thank you. I look forward to uh, if you guys uh, hook up something with the book at the Holocaust Museum. Yes, we okay. hope so. Michelle, what did your sister end up doing? Um, well, she she married a guy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, actually, yes, a uh, actually a former buddy of my brother's that uh, from the Korean War. Hmm. Um, but, you know, again, at that time, you know, we're talking about probably about the 70, 75 years ago, yeah. uh, it, it, it was unusual for a woman to work. Yeah. She, she, she became a she, housewife, essentially? Uh, yes. Yeah, essentially, although she, she, did, she did work, uh, I don't double know, uh, well, but she worked for a time at Doubleday and at some other company. Uh, I forget, like in, export import company where she would translate uh, French documents or English to French or French to English, I forget which direction. Um, so that's, that, that's, what, that's what she did. Thank you. Um, Bernard, did you have another question? Um, yeah, there are, there are a couple things. I, I thought, you know, the family has such a, such a depth of knowledge and uh, Michelle had written a book, uh, and uh, his his brother um, had written a book. Uh, it's called the first one was called Hidden in France, mm -hmm. and the other is Frenchy. Frenchy was his exploits when he was drafted to go to Korea, and I thought it's so ironic that here was this picture of these children who were crawling all over these tanks to get gum and and um, and candy, and. Uh, uh, here was uh, here was his brother now in Korea, giving out candy and chewing gum to kids half a world away. Um, the the other question I had, and and we almost touched on it for a while, is um, we see a rise in this country of right wing extremists, and I wonder from your perspective and your family's perspective whether you've talked about whether we we all should have uh, a great deal of trepidation about these people that are rising up just as, just as you hadn't really seen what was going on uh, in, your, 
in, as, as you were five years old when you, when you were separated, but should we be concerned today about the rise of the right-wing extremists, the Nazis that, are, that we see in the streets? Yeah, I think so. Um, you know, until recently, um, I mean, you know, a few, a few years ago, I, I think people had at the back of their minds, you know, it, it, it can't happen here. A book by one of our famous Americans uh, is that uh, called It Can't Happen Here, uh, I think. It's, and we see how, in, in a sense, how relatively little it takes to make it happen here. So, yes, I think we should be concerned. And we have given money to the Anti-Defamation League uh, because they are labeling hate speech and it is being picked up by the press. Okay, thank you. You know, that's, that's always in the back of our minds when we come to an election like this and we see the, the extremists that are coming up uh, unbeknownst to us. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Anya and Todd, your uh, still, hand still raised. Are you, did you have another question? I'm sorry. I'm going to blame that on Todd. He forgot to put it down. Oh, okay. <laughs> That's fine. That's fine. I just want to make sure everybody got their, their word in. Um, Joy, did, are you there? I think I'm here. Am I there? You are. Okay. <laughs> Your hand's raised. I'm somewhere. Um, anyway, I'm Joy. I'm Michelle's publisher. And as you could see from talking with him and with Joan, that this has been one of the great privileges of my life. And I just want to say for the record, since we're recording this, that my family is of German origin. And I've spoken about, and my other side is of Polish origin. Um, they came to the States before World War II, but this has been a legacy that I have grappled with my entire life. So I just wanted to bring that into the larger mix of how complex this all is. Um, what I wanted to add is Michelle has a website and I should, I need to say this too. I'm in my office and my cat just brought a mouse in. But anyway, good for that. Um, what I want to say about Michelle's book is he has ancillary essays on his website. And he's got it on the, on the slide there. But it would be worth it to check it out. Um, if you get his book, and I hope you all do, uh, there's ancillary information and a larger discussion going on there. And this discussion can be continued because as Bernard said, particularly what's going on in the country right now, I feel Michelle's message and the clear way he lays the story out, um, it, it tells more than just about anything we're gonna read in the press. So thank you. Well, thank you very much. Um, so the, the website is out of the shadows .com. Um, Please visit, visit the website and, and learn more. It, it's a, it's a fascinating and very brave story. Um, the books are available in the town of Wayne at main point books. Um, they have a supply there. Uh, if they run out, we can get, get more brought in. Um, I believe it's also available on Amazon. Is that correct? Right. And um, I don't know if there's any bookstores closer to you in, in Philly that you'd like to mention. Um, but so it's easy to get up. We have uh, another person raising their hand. Mr. Cohen? Did you? Did you wish to speak? Okay. Um, I'm not sure what happened to Mr. Cohen's not answering. Are you there, Mr. Cohen? Yeah, you hear me? Oh, yeah, we can hear you. I went to college with Michelle. Ah. Michelle was very, very to himself, very quiet. And the first I heard of his story was just a few years ago. And I'm just so glad that he did come, so to speak, out of the closet and bring it up. I read the book and it was fascinating and I have all the respect in the world for you, Mike. Thank you. We called we called the Mike in college. No. <laughs> I didn't. That was that was because I wanted to blend in. That's how I started out. My American life was Mike. 
Wow. Um, and actually, I'll tell you that I pledged under Mike, and he was a tough cookie. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Oh, all right. I, I'd like to thank everyone for coming. 